are in the beautiful Review Cinema in Toronto's West End. And it is a Googleable fact <laughs> that this is the oldest operating theatre in the city that was designed exclusively to show movies and still does. And it seemed like the perfect place to take you because you have done some really cool and interesting and actually funny work in applying machine learning and AI applications to cinema. I think this is a great setup and we should just, you know, move our research lab here. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. There'd be popcorn. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the students are going to love it. So can you tell us a little bit about some of that work? Um, when it started really early, I was a very nerdy kid, so <laughs> I really like math. Um, I took math books to the beach. And then on the other hand, I really like watching movies um, just because I know it fascinated me to see stories about people and you know my mom always told me like stop watching TV that's not gonna bring you a job it turns out it can what, do, what does she say now <laughs> I'm not sure she knows what I do <laughs> <laughs> but basically yes you can marry the two things you can do AI for um, you know creative art so for movies for example so at what stage in your studies did you realize that you could start doing some really interesting things using cinema yeah, I always like to, um, you know, not replace creativity, but enhance creativity. So I just thought, you know, why, why don't I do that for my job? And um, why don't we make AI understand what's going on in the stories, model stories? Um, maybe it can later be used for directors to actually make their stories better, more unique. Um, more interesting in some way, just because you know I, I can quickly browse so much content, and maybe it can provide some useful feedback to creative people. So, can you walk us through how um, that would look in your lab? We're taking movies as a proxy of people's lives, right? Every movie tells a story about someone and what's happening to these people, how re they react. We're trying to kind of capture that with uh, AI. We're trying to make AI understand relationship between people, how they would react in certain situations. And, you know, maybe that way you can make them more natural. So, for example, if we would take a scene from a movie, can you actually understand which are the characters that appear there, what are the relationships, um, you know, emotions that they're experiencing, right? And maybe even some unwritten or unsaid content. For example, a lot of the times in movies, actors act out kind of emotions they're experiencing, but it's not really explicitly told. And on the other hand, books have that information, for example, right? You actually know exactly what's happening in people's heads. Um, so one of the projects we have been doing is can you actually align these two contents and then take a movie scene and find the corresponding part in the book and actually read the minds of these characters. Now we're also doing some, some fun stuff. There was an undergrad that approached me and he wanted to work on predicting effects from movies. So he really likes 4D cinema where you know you go to a cinema and the chairs shake and the splash water and you know, all that. For example, if someone is sitting in a car that's shaking then maybe you want the, your sofa to shake you or something like that. At least that's what he thinks. It's a, <laughs> it's a cool application. Um, I'm not sure that I would want my sofa to shake me. <laughs> <laughs> I want my sofa to bring me popcorn. Yeah. That's, let's oh. take it. <laughs> and see, we didn't even need 4D cinema. <laughs> so what's actually going on under the hood when a system is analyzing or predicting what's happening in a scene? Let's say for an image, right, you would run this through some sort of a convolutional neural network and then, you know, transcribe it into language using recurrent neural networks and uh, there's good ways to train it now with uh, you know, reinforcement learning and things like that. Uh, we've also done some work where now the human is actually observing um, this AI algorithm trying to describe images and giving it language feedback. So saying, oh, there's a actually not a cat in this image, there's a dog. So there's a way to actually put that kind of language as a reward to a reinforcement learning algorithm that um, you know, can kind of correct for, for its mistakes. The marriage of vision, computer vision, and natural language processing. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's not a lot of people who are really focusing on the intersection of the two. What do you think we can solve through the marriage of these two major research areas? I think in the end, we want AI to be communicating with real non-expert people, right? And one way to do that is through language. Right, so you want to have this AI or a vision 
um, algorithm to actually convey what it's seeing, such that any expert, you know, like my grandma or my niece and nephew, can actually understand what's going on and communicate with it. Maybe ask questions, maybe understand what it's seeing, and maybe even teach it, right? So maybe the AI system is making mistakes and you want to use language to correct it, like you would do it for a, to a child. So I think that language just kind of brings that very natural link between any kind of you know, machine learning algorithm, which requires expert knowledge to you know, common people that would be end users of this technology. Can we pull up an example or a demo that you've put together in your lab and, and have you show us exactly what you mean when you're talking about your research. Yeah, so basically what we did is we took um, AI that watches movies and learns how to um, talk, to respond to uh, queries and people, as well as um, be behave, so animate the facial expressions as it's talking. So you're basically seeing a demo of this um, 3D avatar talking to humans based by just learning from movies. It is slightly awkward to be speaking to an avatar, but this is pretty cool. Are you enjoying the summer? I mean, what is your position? How do you feel about the fact that you live contained in a tiny rectangle while the rest of the world goes on outside? And that's not true. He's in the cinema. That's true. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. Is this your first uh, silver screen debut? <laughs> no, this is my home. And how did you train it to do this? Yeah, so the input what you're getting is, um, you know, audio. Or I guess we're taking subtitles, um, which is kind of the language part. And um, we're analyzing facial expressions as well. So that's the input as well. So this is kind of mimicking my um, opponent to whom I'm speaking, right? So understanding what people are conveying to me, both emotionally as well as with language. And then we are outputting the same kind of information. So the language response, as well as the um, kind of the facial expressions that go with it. And we train it by just taking clips from movies and taking input and output. And, you know, it's like a sequence to sequence model. What would be the purpose of having an AI be able to um, predict what's happening? I see it more in two different directions. So one is more as a tool for someone that is trying to make a movie. All right, so for example, let's say they're writing a scene and maybe they want some feedback saying, oh, this scene already happened in this particular movie. Maybe you want to make it more unique. Are you threatening me? Are you threatening me? You threatening me? Are you threatening me? You threatening me? So you're threatening me? You threatening me, Brandon? All right, so it's more like a tool to help artists create better art. And the other way I see it, it trying to teach AI to be more human-like, right? Because movies are about people. So if they actually understand what's going on, and how people react in certain situations, then maybe they should be adopting that kind of behavior. So I think there are probably certain characters in cinema that we don't want to train the AI. That's on. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's also a good point, right? Because maybe you want to train them how not to behave. Right. Or at least in, in ways <laughs> that are it's positive and beneficial. Uh, but the thing in every movie, you always have that evil character as well. And uh, when we were annotating this stuff, we also asked the annotators to kind of mark that. So it serves as an example for how not to behave. Exactly. I mean, think of when you're a kid and your mom tells you, you know, like, you should not do that. Right? So you want someone, some, something like that for AI as well, right? Do you think that we lose something natural or human in um, not accidentally stumbling into something or making a mistake or creating, having a creative process that's entirely human? I think the process should be human, but maybe you can benefit from something that you cannot do, right? For example, if I'm writing a story, I don't know, I cannot read all the other stories that have been written. So I don't know how unique I am or maybe get some feedback of how the audience is going to perceive it or whether they're going to like it or not. And that kind of thing can be done by AI, right? Because very quickly it can read, you know, 10,000 books or understand what audience like or not like. And you can get that kind of feedback on the fly and can guide you to actually maybe create better art. But I absolutely think that you know, there is a human aspect to art that we should be enhancing and not replacing. So when removed from um, the full spectrum of, of how a movie is envisioned and created, it must be really interesting to see how the AI is interpreting our 
experience, our human experience, and the way we express that experience. Have you, what have you observed about the human condition from this? It's kind of funny, right? Because we were in the beginning of this exploring, exploring AI in this area. So I think the AI doesn't really know the common sense that people have, right? Like we go, go through life years and years, you interact with so many people, you have all this other knowledge that you have access to, right? You watch TV, news, you talk to people. So AI doesn't have any of that right now. It just sees what it sees in a movie. So it's trying to replicate that. In a future with mass unemployment, young people are forced to sell blood. Something I can do. <laughs> you should see the boy and shut up. I was the one who was going to be 100 years old. So a lot of times it makes mistakes that are very funny to us just because, you know, a person would never do that. Um, but it might, might be kind of there in some movies taken out of context, right? Um, but there's all this whole other knowledge that we are not exploiting now in AI yet. So one of, the, one of the really interesting things about the way that most people or spectators consume movies is that we're just taking it in as an art. We're taking it in as an experience, but we're not thinking as much about the technical aspects. The truth is that there's no cinema without technology. Where does AI fit into a new era of cinema? I think you can actually enhance um, people writing the stories, maybe even you know give feedback to the actors how well they're doing. Then there is um, maybe less creative, but more on the technical side, maybe you know generate better scenes for the movies, right? Um, which graphics people are doing all the time, so I'm sure there's already some AI going on there. So, what would be one of the really dream applications that you can conceive of working on in the future that would build on what you're doing now? I would say that I'm already living the dream. I get to work <laughs> every day and just do fun stuff. Um, so I really want to kind of make um, robots that are more natural. They uh, you know, understand humans, behave in a natural way. They can converse with them um, in natural ways. They are active, right? So they ask questions to learn, just basically like humans would. And I guess I, I visit a lot my, um, my family in Slovenia, so I have a little niece and nephew and you know I kind of try to get inspired and ask them you know what kind of robot should be making for you and they said oh we want a robot that's gonna take us for ice cream and not <laughs> tell mom, which is basically my job when I'm there. Um, <laughs> And uh, not that I would want the robot to take children for ice cream, but <laughs> <laughs> it kind of gets you thinking, like, where are we and what, what problems do we still need to solve to get there, right? And, um, you know, this is from my niece, and I keep it as a reminder that we're not there yet. And oh, thank you so much for um, talking film. And I think your research in particular is um, a really eye-opening way of looking at the applications of something that is still considered a core science, but there's so much more to what we can do. AI is just the tool to allow us to explore all the things that interest us and that we love in the world. And before we go, I just have one more question for my new friend up here. Um, how was this experience for you? Well, I was a little drunk. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Sonia. Thank you. <laughs>